Hello, I'm inside, you're inside, we're all inside, this is Corleone Inside. I am Eric Light, Artistic Director of That Fine Ensemble, and we are glad to have you back live with us on our live stream. This has been a wonderful little experiment. Uh, we had such a good time talking with Michael McGlynn last week and wonderful response from all of you. And we thought we'd continue the game with uh, one of my favorite groups uh, on the entire planet, Chanticleer. We've got uh, two of their members with us this evening. But before we get into uh, talking with those guys, I uh, wanted to start this off with a little bit of music from Corleone. This is a uh, piece that uh, was written by Twin Cities composer Craig Carnahan. He originally did it in uh, soprano, alto, tenor, bass format. And I loved uh, the work so much, I asked him to reset it for, for men's voices, for Corleone for one of our annual Remembrance Day programs. The text of the work comes from the great war poet Siegfried Sassoon. It's probably one of the most famous poems ever about singing. Everyone suddenly burst out singing. Uh, uh, the piece is called uh, Armistice 1918. The idea here is trying to sum up that moment when the guns fell silent on the First World War and uh, the song of the soldiers was, was finally heard instead of the gunfire. Uh, and I think that uh, this really sums up, this, this poem and this piece of music really sums that moment up. But I think uh, even more more than that, uh, this this poem has become kind of a, a hymn to to singing and to, and to making music. Uh, and I thought, with us being a little socially distant these days, it would be nice to hear. So this is Armistice 1918 by Craig Carnahan.
The singing will never be done. That is wonderful work by Craig Carnahan, Twin Cities composer, and his setting of Siegfried Sassoon's Armistice 1918. I love that sentiment. It was fun to uh, spend time with that piece a little bit this week and just remember that uh, final message of the singing never being done. Uh, <laughs> what I could use, frankly. Uh, I am so thrilled. Uh, one of the great joys of doing this show is bringing in uh, artists that you, whose work you just admire and getting to spend a little bit of time uh, with them digitally, uh, pick their brains a little bit and just uh, uh, catch a little bit of that energy that happens when creative people are uh, all together. And so uh, I want to, uh, from the extraordinary group Chanticleer, the uh, reigning male choir of the world, uh, probably one of the most important groups uh, to me in, in, in getting me into doing what I do. I would like to welcome to the show uh, Logan Shields and Jared Pagenkoff. Hello, guys. Hey there, Hello. thank you. It's great to have you. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great you to be here. Are Oh, it's it's good. It's good. Uh, so I just to take a moment and uh, if, since now we've got three of us here, so it's a, it, we're, we're multiplying every week, it seems. Uh, you just take a moment and introduce yourselves to uh, to to everyone here. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm Logan Shields. Uh, I'm in my fourth season uh, singing soprano uh, count tenor with uh, Chanticleer, uh, originally from Michigan. Uh, I studied vocal performance at Western Michigan University and vocal performance at Grand Valley State University. And I'm Jared. Um, I am in my fifth season with Shanna Clear singing um, soprano and countertenor with Logan. Um, I'm originally from uh, Northeast Wisconsin, if you can wonder where that is. Um, now, uh, I'm going to stop you right there okay. because I have been to your fair. What city did you what town did you grow up in? Well, the, I didn't actually grow up in a town. I grew up on a farm, but my mailing address <laughs> is in Cecil. Wisconsin. It was in Cecil. Now, I used to go to a deer hunting cabin just outside of Cecil, <laughs> near yeah, just, near Shawano. I know exactly. I know exactly where you grew up, <laughs> uh, and I'm sure I'm probably the only person that could talk to you that's been to Cecil more than <laughs> once. So. <laughs> Probably, yeah. I didn't, didn't mean to interrupt, but oh, and okay. there's there's very little Wisconsin love that I can show on this show. So uh, uh, I'm I'm just I'm just glad there's another one of us out there. So yeah, I'm very glad <laughs> to help you out with that. Uh, yeah, so um, I uh, went to college in uh, Madison at the University of Wisconsin Madison, go Bucky! And um, I have a degree in music education from that fine institution, and I have a master's degree in vocal performance from the University of Houston. Um, Go Cougs, I guess. There you go. A lot of school pride going on, too. I didn't know we were going to get shout outs. Oh, you're going to get all letters from your alumni association <laughs> well, from, from this. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking for money. Um, <laughs> So uh, both of you uh, sing soprano in, in, in or in, in, we actually had talked about this a little bit in our further inside section, but you sing soprano in, in Chanticleer. Is that, is that a correct way to, to, to say this? I think that's the most direct way to say it, you know, for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. And Chanticleer, unlike what what you heard from Corleone there, who traditionally does uh, tenor, tenor, baritone, bass music, Chanticleer predominantly sings soprano, alto, tenor, bass uh, music. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Um, why? <laughs> Um, our founder, uh, Louis Botto, um, who founded uh, Chanticleer in 1978, uh, was studying early music area at Occidental College, I think. Um, and uh, uh -oh. are we uh, are we catching Jared here? Yes, Logan, the joys of live uh, stream. Yes, welcome right. to live television. Yes, we'll see if we can buffer you better, Jared. Logan, you're on. Uh, this could uh, be yeah. your version of the history. <laughs> well, I, I've heard the spiel a few times. Uh, so yeah, as he mentioned, uh, Lewis was studying early music at the time. Uh, and of course, when one dives into that, they start to uh, discover that uh, in the church, women were not allowed to sing uh, in the church. Uh, so you were relying on boys and uh, men, fal falsettists. So to, of course, 
jump into period performance practice, uh, Lewis thought it would be a great idea to get together some singers uh, from the Symphony Chorus in San Francisco and Grace Cathedral and try that music out with all men. Um, and they got together around a dinner table in January of 78, uh, and they, they sang through some stuff and uh, had some spaghetti and decided, you know, this is actually a pretty rad sound. And so uh, they kind of put together a program, started rehearsing that, and gave their first concert in June of 78. And then from there, you know, I mean, you think about um, the early music revival had happened, of course, it was starting to happen just before that. And uh, they were kind of a good time to, to show up and say, hey, here's some period performance uh, stuff from, from guys. So. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and I think it's uh, really important to say, it, it, maybe to, to reiterate another reason why uh, Chanticleer exists in, in, in this way. That sound is just very different when the two of you are singing a soprano line on the Palestrina piece that we're about to hear versus if uh, a, 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 mi a mixed group is there. Could you, would you describe, would you, how could you describe the difference of, of, of the sound uh, with what you do in Chanticleer versus what maybe a mixed choir would do with the same repertoire? Jared. Yeah, um, well, um, we definitely don't sound like women. I mean, we do to an extent, but mostly not. Um, uh, it's just, it's very different. I, it's, it's hard, it's a hard thing to put into words because um, it's, uh, it's I, I, and I can't even, I can't even describe it, but, but with us, like we, we are, we unabashedly sing the counter the soprano and alto parts and we're not trying to sound like women when we do it uh because we can't um now if you listen to somebody like cortez saying he has a bit more of a of a, of a female sounding voice and it's it's absolutely gorgeous um but uh i think uh, yeah I, with logan i know that his his ideal is kind of this the 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 boy boy soprano um uh cathedral uh choir kind of soprano and that's not even a female sound either. It's it's no. just very different. It's very different. Yeah. Well, we're not going to have to make you talk about it. Let's uh, take a <laughs> listen to this. Uh, this uh, could you could you introduce this 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 first piece uh, by Palestrina? Yeah, this is a motet by a Palestrina called Gaude Gloriosa. It's one of the Mar Marian antiphon pieces. Hail um, Queen of Heaven. Uh, it was a. a, a, a the video you're about to see was a promotional video for our um, 40th anniversary album, Then and There, Here and Now. Um, and this was something that they that we filmed. Um, and it's just a really special piece of music. For wonderful. Five. Yes, with a wonderful backstage video. This is Chanticleer. That was Chanticleer. And uh, before we get in any further, I want to remind everybody to uh, uh, hit subscribe and get the notifications for YouTube. Uh, make sure that you've joined us on, on Facebook and, and like Corleone there so that you can get these every single uh, week. And uh, also know that the comments and questions are, are, are there. Uh, Phil Jack, our producer, will be monitoring those questions and uh, we will have some time uh, to ask uh, Logan and Jared uh, anything that you want. Well, not any thing we will editorialize that so uh uh yeah so we'll, we'll save you from anything like really really scandalous um loved seeing that guys and and my god i i just i have to say even com even compared to a lot of maybe some of the european uh uh, uh male groups that sing in the same ranges and all uh, as chanticleer there's 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 definitely um a, a chanticleer sound is is there not that's that's existed now for uh, God, how many years has it been? It's 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 been a long time, and uh, I'm not sure I could put my my finger on it either. But um, hearing the period music sung with those voices, you get why this was this was made. This ensemble, right, right. It's um to me, it's kind of touch back on what you asked, Jared. It's the sound is just. Yeah. It, there's a purity and a drive behind that sound that um, that I you know it's something that we find with the falsetto, but it it just the way when you set foot in a cathedral and you start singing that music, I mean the way just our D naturals you know comparatively in the staff cut through and just like mm -hmm. there's just this sort of brilliance with 
uh, just enough edge that I think it's you know obviously other than just being men singing uh, high, it it adds that <laughs> it adds that that brilliance, you know. And there's there's definitely going to be different. Your voice is going to have different passagios and different breaks in it than say a, a woman singing th th those same parts. For each of you, could you could you do a quick rundown of like where your registrations go and and how you negotiate, you know. Th these these parts and your voices yeah um for me uh i noticed a big shift between a in the middle of the staff and like b flat um and for me to sit at a in the b flat b natural is 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 difficult um, um so music that just hammers those notes um is hard for me uh, i get above a b natural and it feels really really great mm -hmm. um uh, i think logan's yours is a little bit different than mine is it not <laughs> Yeah, so um, you know, there's like a, a kind of an extra shift happening right around C, uh, C five in the middle yep. of the staff, uh, and then I notice right around when I start to touch E and F at the top, I kind of I have two choices: it's really give it some gusto and you know fill fill it out, or or try and find this kind of more flute like sound that um, you know maybe has less color and less spin. Um, and then in terms of the low end, um, where I I find myself differing from other counter tenors is my the tenor training that I had had in college actually starts to creep in towards the bottom of the staff. So I'll, I'll choose often uh, just a heady sound versus pure falsetto for D, E flat at the bottom of that staff. And are you finding yourself bringing uh, your, your falsetto voice down sometimes and then finding a mix other times in that in that lower part? Or do you stay try to stay within one kind of vocalism? Mm, yeah, I kind of like to think of it as choosing a position, a fingering position, but a vocal position, sure. you know. Um, uh, it just really depends on, I guess, where the bulk of the, the testatory is after some of those breaks. Because, you know, sometimes we do uh, as we do early music in keys that can't be done by mixed ensembles, and it requires us to do, for portions of the piece, quite a bit of kind of tenory singing. So once we hop back into kind of soprano land, then it's, then it's trying to right. stay in falsetto as much as possible. And I ask this because, you know, we do TTBB music and uh, depending on how, who the composer is, Schubert, um, he <laughs> writes these incredibly high first tenor parts that, you know, what, what was, what was the intent there is it's sitting on high A's for the tenor. Was that supposed to be in falsetto? Was that going to be in full voice? Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different, uh, approaches that, you know, even we have to use in regarding to how and when and where to use, uh, f falsetto, even within the tenor land, uh, for, 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 for our singing. So it's great to hear this, that that you know how uh, that you have to negotiate this as well in 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 your music. I would like to ask if you had three big misconceptions about singing soprano in Chanticleer. What might they be? Or maybe a better way to ask this question is: Are there three questions you wish you'd never ha get asked again about singing soprano in Chanticleer? The first one for me is: Does it hurt? <laughs> Well, Man, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> it's not Just thought I'd ask. I will say sometimes it's not, no. always, <laughs> it's not always comfortable, but it, it never hurts. I mean, if it hurts, you're doing something wrong, or you're not doing what you should be doing. Um, so that's my number one. Like, are you serious? Question. Um, what's another one, Logan? Oh dear. Oh, dear. Uh, I, I. You'd be surprised how often people ask me if I'm singing in my falsetto for like high B flats, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I understand, you know, it, not everyone's coming in, uh, not every audience member is of course some trained singer. So I, but it is, it's, you know, it's in the program and it's, it's on our website and it's, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so they don't I, read that Logan. Oh, no, I know, I know, but, you know but no, that. really, really it's, it's often like a, so you, is that your chest voice? And it's like, well, I don't, if that were my chest voice, I think I, I think I'd ask for more money. That's <laughs> Right. Uh, you, but it is interesting because I think a lot of uh, people do hear falsetto and because there is a lot more ping and color in what you guys do a, a lot of times and a lot of, I think, a lot more variation of color up there than I think 
maybe sometimes countertenors get get credit for. Um, I can understand maybe why an audience member could think that, if, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, we got guys in the group. I mean, Adam Ward, one of our longstanding altos, he's, I mean, there are times I have to ask him, like, are, are you chesting that right now? <laughs> like, it's it's incredible what some of the, some of the voices can do uh, in terms of, like, core and just real crunch and bite in that sound, so... Yeah, and um, and I would say also, Chanticleer's always been known for not just dig digging only into Renaissance music, but uh, the whole range of, of 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 music, and and has commissioned so many works and so many, frankly, important pieces uh, that they've added to the uh, to the to the stable of, of, of choral music. And um, uh, I want to play uh, this, this next piece. And it was something that I did not uh, know at all. I did a little bit of research on it and I found uh, the, what I found about the genesis of this piece really, really fascinating. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, this weight fantasy that we're going to play next? Um, yeah, um, this is um a fantastic piece of music that Logan and I have yet to um, add to our arsenal of pieces. But uh, it's uh, a lot of members in the ensemble who, who premiered it still speak so highly of it. Um, they approach this composer, Steve Hackman, who is also a conductor um, and has kind of a reputation for, for mashing up um, different genres of music, mostly classical music and contemporary pop music. I think, uh, I think he does like Beethoven and Radiohead or something like that or uh, Brahms yeah. like you do Brahms and Radiohead, yes yes like you do and so they asked him to create some music for us and um, he came back with this this kind of obscure song by this French group called M83 um, called Wait and um, had a, an amazing piece of, of Emily Dickinson poetry to put with it called Waiting and he just fuses them together and it's almost like you don't know where one piece starts and where the other one ends. And it's, it's just this huge fantasy and you, and you listen to it. And at the end, you're, you, you almost don't know what you've been listening to. It's just so captivating um, and seamless and, and, and compelling and charismatic. I mean, it's just, I like the piece. <laughs> I, do, I, I fell in love with it and it was just something I, I had no idea what, the, what, it, what it was, but you don't know if you're listening to like a, a you know, like, as you say, like a like a rock uh, acapella version of something, or a, a, a major classical piece, and uh, and and frankly, by by about a minute into it, I didn't care anymore because I was just so uh, uh, th uh, thrilled with this piece. Well, I, I let's uh, let's just get on with it. This is a uh, weight fantasy and and Chanticleer.
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm spent. <laughs> Uh, it you know I, I it was so wonderful to spend the week uh, with with that piece and uh, uh, and and get a little bit of your insights on it as well. But it's for me it's so rare when uh, a piece of music its message is so direct and so clear in the trappings of extraordinarily complicated choral writing. Uh, I, that those two things I don't think uh, happen all that often. It's just just fabulous, guys. This, thank you, thank you for uh, for sharing that for us. Uh, I want to bring into the mix here our producer and good friend Phil Jack. Oh, Phil. Phil, are you here? Are you here, oh, Phil? Oh, oh the there you are. Now. Hi. Now it's now it's the four of us. Oh, I think you're still on mute, sir. I uh, shouldn't be. <laughs> Oh, maybe not. Um, so uh, we'll see if he Phil. Just you talk whenever you get uh, get the get that figured out. Um, I'm just interested in um, uh, your touring life. What 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 might you be doing right now if you were not sitting here talking to me? And uh, you know what what's 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 not going on? I guess in Chanticleer's life. Mm, yeah, so we, of course, we're going to be on tour right now. Uh, actually, it was uh, March, thir Friday the 13th was the last day that we all convened uh, because of everything that was unfolding, obviously. And uh, we had uh, a gala planned and we had a, an Inside Chanticleer series planned uh, and two more tours before propping up this next program and doing a Bay Area tour. So, um, you know, it's... It's definitely a, a lot different than where we would be, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know, Jared could probably expand on that a little I, bit. I, none of us should, and nor should we conjecture as to yeah. anything, since the <laughs> scientists still can't get it right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Phil, are you, did you, have you figured yourself out here? I did. Are you, I am now are you truly alive? on the internet for oh, everyone. Oh, hi. Uh, and now we're all together. That feels really good. Any comments or questions from uh, from the folks out there in YouTube or Facebook? Land? We definitely have some pretty excited, interesting people in the comments. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Interesting or interested? Yeah, um. why not? <laughs> uh, here's here's one um, related to that last piece. <laughs> wait, uh, wait, fantasy. Um, Martha asks, "How do you rehearse a piece like this?" Ooh, um, it's tough. It's tough because uh, that the weight fantasy is one of those pieces where every single person is singing his own part. Um, and so, what one thing that we can do is just take do a lot of sectional work where the sopranos and altos go off into a room, tenors and basses um, stay go into a different room and just hash out their things, um, parts with each other. Um, those are mammoth pieces to put together and they often take the most amount of time to do um, because any number of, and it's not, it's a, it's a long piece too. That's the other thing is that any number of things can go wrong in seven minutes. <laughs> and so um, one of the things we do is try to find um, signposts where we can all kind of get back on if things go awry. Um, but it, it is one of the big challenges of taking a, a new piece like that and figuring out how to put it together as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, and it, I would guess so much interdependence required between singer to singer, right? I mean, you have to lean on, on, on your friends around you to be able to do your part as well as you can. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are moments where you almost have to know at least four or five other parts as well as your own. Um, so you know how you fit into that or you know what you need to listen for um it's but that's the exciting part about music isn't it right yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> and you guys it's not that you learn this piece and get to sing it twice it, it gets to go on tour and live and breathe and and uh not a, not many musicians get that aspect of it like like chanticleer does like conscious did when you know when 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 i was w with with those groups to be able to sing a piece 50 times in a year is is sort of unheard of mm -hmm. uh uh what what to you what is the, what is the biggest growing aspect of of performing a work that that much or what's Ooh. the what's the what's the sweetest part of 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 that for you? Well, right. Once you 
once you get past the uh, strange harmonic language or moments and pieces like like what we just listened to, and once you've kind of nailed down, uh, especially uh, musical or technical things, I think finally being able to really let the piece live through you, especially uh, diving into uh, the, the text translations of works. Um, when something goes from, oh, I have to make sure all these chords are pretty to, oh, now I have to make sure these chords are pretty and I have to make sure I'm showing something to, I'm completely engulfed in this feeling while performing this piece. And there's this, you know, just this constant uh, relationship with the audience. Th that's probably for me, one of the biggest payoffs is, oh my gosh, I don't have to stress about mm, make sure the faith is high enough. And, you know, you just, things are coming out of you in, and sometimes you just get lost in those moments, uh, especially, you know, half the year in uh, or three, you know, the, sometimes some of my favorite concerts of a program are, you know, the two weeks out from the end of it. And you, you realize I'm not looking at my score and I'm not thinking about the next like high note and I'm not. And you're just you just in music. You're you're, you know. Time. Yes. Time even stops working properly. Like you are in this in this sort of almost liminal state is when I when, when I feel when I'm feeling that is is uh, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm truly, it's about the only time in my life where I'm truly present, if that, if that makes sense. And it's, it's something that I, at least I, I strive for. Uh, Jared, any, any thoughts on, on that? Yeah. I, one of the challenges of performing a, a piece of music that many times is trying to find some kind of inspiration after the 50th or 60th or 75th time that you've performed it. Um, but that's one of the things that we get to do is to dig deep, like, like music is like an onion and you just keep on digging another layer off of the top and finding out something else exciting. And for me, what's exciting in a performance is when I hear something that I've never heard before in a piece, like a certain line that maybe, you know, the tenors are singing because I mean, honestly, who listens to the tenors, <laughs> uh, but you know, <laughs> so <Savage. laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's like something something that I've never heard before, and and that's exciting to me. Is that music can be different every single time you do it, and that's great. <laughs> and I would assume, and at least this was my experience, uh, when you are working conductorless, uh, that 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 organism. Uh, grows and changes night to night, acoustic to acoustic. Oh, if yeah. you had fish or chicken for dinner, all of, all of those sorts of things. Um, mainly the fish or chicken, I would assume, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Big impact. Yeah, Phil, any other uh, comments or questions from the, from the peanut gallery? I'm sure they love being called the peanut gallery. I'm sure they do. <laughs> uh, there have been a couple questions or comments regarding um, how, when you're singing, you look at each other and maybe why or when you might do that. Yeah, and I've been to many sh Chandler concerts, and you guys sing in a lot of different formations. Uh, sometimes you're straight out to the audience, sometimes you're turned in. What's the idea? What's the philosophy? Um, sometimes we find that certain standing arrangements are, are conducive for certain pieces of music we sing. Um, for example, if we're singing a double chorus piece, it might be helpful for us to stand in that double chorus formation. Um, sometimes we do it just for audience, um, just to mix it up for the audience, because after a while you get sick of staring at the same people um, in the same spot. Um, but uh, as far as like looking at each other, that's one of the great, well, it's one of the challenges about not having a conductor is that we have to, we have to communicate with each other. We don't have a person to uh, keep us together. So we have to keep ourselves together. Um, and so looking at each other is one of the big ways. Well, it's probably one of the only ways to do that, actually. Um, and sometimes it's, it's, sometimes it's just nice to look at somebody and, and say, hey, I see you over there on stage. I'm here too. You know, sometimes it's just it just kind of breaks breaks the wall for us as 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 um, the performers that that we're. It kind of goes back to what you said, Eric, about being in the moment. Um, it's kind of a, a chance for us to be in the moment. That it's not just a rote um, exercise. Type thing. Yeah. And I, I always found that, uh, especially when I'm working with uh, maybe like a magical group at a high school or something like that, they're always been so used to watching the conductor. And then finally, there isn't one. And they have to look each other in the eyes and sing. That can be such a... Um, 
vulnerable and disarming place to be. Uh, we don't do that very often, but to truly look someone in the eyes and share a, a, a line of music with them, um, it's quite intimate. Very intimate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's... Sorry. Go ahead, Logan. No, go ahead, Logan. Oh, you know, I was going to say, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's definitely a kind of contemporary, you know, choral world spiel, but it's we need more of that today. And in this is like society and the changing is in the ways that things are moving from, you know, interpersonal relationships to just digital relationships and I, you know, not to go on a whole other tangent, but it, it I mean what you bring up is specifically why we do what we do and why we will continue to do what we do. I couldn't uh, agree with you more, and I think that is a beautiful place to leave it, guys. Uh, I, I want to thank you again from the bottom of my hearts uh, for sharing some time with us that we could look each other in the eyes, or at least the cameras, uh, uh, and maybe not sing together, but to share uh, in this uh, in in this way. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for for your vulnerability and your willingness to share. Um, and we're going to leave it with uh, I think one of the great arrangements I, I've heard you you guys. Do. Uh, this is Queen and uh, somebody to love. Thank you, Logan. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. You're very welcome. Somebody to love, find me. 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 Somebody to love, find me.
keep the party rolling here uh, i'm going to just play straight away another uh, piece of music uh, from corleone uh i just want to before i do that announce uh, next week's guest i'm really 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 excited about this we'll have donald nally who conducts uh, the crossing one of the i think finest professional choirs in uh, north america uh re- specializing almost exclusively in uh in brand new music so i'm really excited to uh share uh, his really incredible gift with us uh this is uh from a couple years back uh corleone singing a quebecois song called oh yo yo and this is an arrangement by the great stephen hatfield Well, we hope you can uh, join us for further Inside Corleone, which will be up n- tomorrow uh, on YouTube. A lot of questions that I think that were out there in uh, YouTube and Facebook land uh, will get answered there. And uh, a great way to spend some more time with uh, with with Jared and with, with Logan. They've been just uh, wonderful guests. I hope that you all take care of yourselves, take care of each other, uh, keep a song on your hearts, and we will see you next week. Boom.